the 10 likes. I love it. I love how how many likes are already hit, been hit since the stream has not even started yet. Thank you very much for hitting that like button when you come into the uh, to the stream. The algorithm will pick up the videos, send it around for more people to join in. It makes the uh, comment section a whole lot more fun. All right, today we're going to be talking about freight. Freight demand trucking in this country has dropped dramatically. There are a lot of companies that have gone out of business. Earnings are falling dramatically. And there is no sign of any kind of recovery or turnaround, although there is a talk about it bottoming out, like the trucking recession or the freight recession has has met its bottom and time will tell if that is the truth of the matter but really what has taken place here and you know it seems pretty interesting that just a few years ago there was a shortage of trucking right all this trucking companies were unavailable to haul this massive amount of stuff throughout the country ports were clogged and congested outside of the ports with freighters just waiting for these truckers to move the stuff away from the ports and be able to uh, make supply start to function again but there was this huge shortage of trucking right i mean so much so that the government wanted to get the national guard involved to get these containers away from the ports quicker i mean it was so prevalent within the system that freight companies were charging in a, an extreme amount to haul stuff around. I mean, you know, even shipping a container from China to the United States went from like $5,000 to better than $25,000. There was just simply nothing available as far as space goes when it comes to the freight industry when there was so much congestion taking place back during the pandemic and the lockdowns. Now, really, what we have to think about is the bullwhip effect. That's really what's taken place inside of this. So back during the pandemic, when everything was locked down, the even like the availability of trucking at the time had dropped dramatically because a lot of people had just simply retired. Right. A lot of the truckers that were out there just said, hey, I'm not doing it anymore. And at the same time, there was a lack of new people being trained. Right. So generally, I mean, you know, it doesn't take that long to learn to drive a truck, but it does take some time. And, you know, if you have nobody who's being trained and you have a bunch of people who are basically leaving that industry, then you're going to have a gap of drivers inside of that. So a lot of people who just didn't want to go to work because they were scared to the people who weren't trained to and people who just left the industry left a huge gap in the availability of being able to transport stuff around this nation. So this is really one of the reasons why we had such a interesting times back during the lockdowns that didn't have the available trucking. Right? So at that time, when the prices shot way up to haul things around this nation, the, the, the cost of freight, people see that. The investors see that. Individuals see that and say, hey, I want to take advantage of that. I want to be able to charge an extreme amount to haul stuff around this nation as well. And so they start investing into new trucks or investing into new drivers or investing into the idea that they are going to take advantage of this higher prices. So as people start to invest into this higher prices or the idea of higher prices, all of a sudden the overcapacity begins to take place. This is what we are experiencing now. So as the overcapacity begins to take place, all the malinvestment that's out there begins to present itself. People who had spent too much money on trucks, drivers, training, whatever it was, no longer can operate at the lower prices. And so they end up going out of business. And this is what we're starting to see now within the trucking industry. So when we think about like some of the things that were taking place during the pandemic and the lockdowns and that overwhelming consumer demand that was simply false, it didn't exist, it wasn't real. All right. And I know a lot of times people were, you know, would think, no, nah, there's the shift from going from, you know, like, you know, going to brick and mortar stores to going to online. And there was all this kind of stuff, whatever. Right. Really, what ended up happening was, is that there was a lockdown of new freight coming into this nation. At the same time, a stimulus package was handed out. This stimulus package had everybody going out there and consuming in a way that they typically would not have done. 
when they start consuming in a way that they typically would not have done, they take the items off the shelf and with no new freight coming in, what happens? All right? Demand shoots way up. Because there's nothing available and people are saying, oh my God, I don't have this available to me. I'm willing to pay a higher price for it, right? Inflation starts to take place. On top of that, if you're the type of person who runs a business that says, man, I am not being, I cannot get the available items I need in order to conduct my business because I'm being allocated against. I need 10, but I only received three. Well, maybe I'll order 30 and hope that I get 10. Overwhelming consumer demand that just simply does not exist. It was not real. So when this overwhelming consumer demand was taking place and those prices shot up and the demand for truckers were out there, this is the investment that started moving into it. Right? Well, after time goes by and people realize, man, we didn't really need all this stuff and you have a lack of stuff that's coming in, this is where the truckers, the freight companies are making their money or the lack thereof. Right? So when people are no longer ordering new items and it's not coming in in the fashion that it once was, then now you have an overcapacity of trucking, you're going to continue to see the trucking slow down. This is preliminary to a recession. So you now you think about it, all this stuff that was out there that was eventually consumed and now the time to replenish is no longer being replenished in the, uh, in the way that one would think would be logical to an expanding economy. That's not happening. I don't care what you see out there in the news as far as retail is expanding or whatever. It's not. I work retail for a living. I know other retailers that are out there. I know wholesalers, distributors. Right? Everybody is saying the same thing. It's slowed down dramatically. Even since the beginning of the year, it is slowed down. And now this makes a lot of sense when you think about what it is that was taking place within the Federal Reserve's comments and the narrative out there in the mainstream media, what it came to, an int to interest rates. People believed at the end of last year, at the end of 2023, in the beginning of 2024, that there was going to be somewhere around seven or eight interest rate cuts this year. And that somehow there was going to be this miraculous recovery in the... I, availability of homes for people to purchase and stuff like that. There was all this crazy ideas that were that was taking place. That's not the case anymore, right? People are no longer believing that there's going to be the massive amount of rate cuts. In fact, some people are starting to believe that there's going to be interest rate hikes going into the future. And if this is the case, then you're going to see a dramatic slowdown in the churning over of dollars, right? Basically, people willing to spend their money. If you're earning money and you're spending it right away, this increases the economy in a, in a way that they call hot, right? A hot economy where people are earning and spending. But if people are earning and not spending or even earning and paying off debt, this is going to slow the, dramatic, slow the economy down dramatically in what they would refer to as a cold economy. All right, I'm going to leave it at that. Let's go and see what some of you guys are talking about. I kind of stumbled through this uh, live stream today. All right, Brody says, thanks, Simon. All right, thank you, Brody. Uh, bruise up the like button on the way into the stream to get more dynamic chat going. Yeah, absolutely. We've got 187 people watching right now with 38 likes. Go hit that like button. Hey, Brody, like button. All right, here we go. Brody, Simon, what's up, everyone? Doing, okay, Old Nider says, doing well. About to go do some painting with my son right on... Rich says, yo, UE, what up, buddy? All right, enjoy, Hyder. All right, I work for Walmart. Through COVID, they paid an extra $250 to work an extra day. Huh. Yeah. Uh, it started in the beginning of 2022. It's the worst it's ever been for trucking. And, you know, that's what's funny about it. Now, you think about it, it was just a few years ago, like, literally, the government wanted to hire the National Guard, like, it, it, get the National Guard to start driving freight around this nation. Like, think about that. Today, trucking companies are going out of business. That's, that's such a dramatic change. Like, you know, to think about what it was that was taking place during the pandemic that got the increase of trucking to the dramatic level that it is today that they are now shutting down operations in such a dramatic fashion. 
I mean, this that was a major bullwhip effect that was happening there. You know? All right. They were corn balls over it too, still waiting for my first stimmy. <laughs> All right. In a market divorced from reality, what matters anymore? <laughs> I strongly agree. Early in 2022, the trucking industry has gotten brutal and has not improved two years of pain to the trucking industry. Yeah. Uh, quality of divorce attorneys is very important in times like these. <laughs> All right, Stay Curious says, it's a good time to buy used guitars. Lots of used gu guitars are sitting and not selling. No one needs luxury goods right now. Yeah, and that's what we're going to find continuing as far as what I'm thinking going into the future is that you're going to start seeing a lot of the luxury items that people were purchasing with their stimulus checks. You're going to start seeing a lot of that stuff coming up for sale and a much cheaper price. People are going to be needing the necessities and not the luxury items. And that's really where a lot of the money is going to be spent. You're gonna find things like food and fuel and electricity and stuff like that not coming down in a dramatic fashion. You might see some price relief on a lot of that stuff, but you're not gonna see it come down dramatically. What you are gonna see come down dramatically are things like TVs and cars and you know anything that's luxurious like things that are not necessity i know a lot of people look at a vehicle as a necess necessity item but not an expensive vehicle like you can get more of a affordable vehicles out there all right uh, no rate cuts only bait cuts yeah that's about right <laughs> All uh, right, Patrick says, what are your thoughts on automation along with AI bringing down cost of labor factor to reshore our industry base in both short term and long term? I don't I don't know how much that's actually going to help. Like, I mean, the same things that would seem reasonable for us to have a manufacturing base here. Other nations are going to have that as well. So what it's going to come down to if it's not the labor cost and it's going to be land cost energy cost transportation cost right and so if you have a cheap transportation cost like we're finding in trucking right freight freight costs are coming down quite a bit and you have cheaper land cost and energy costs in another nation combining all those together may still make it more efficient and profitable to manufacture outside of the United States, even if you have automation going on, right? I mean, this is, it, it's, it's a lot like anything else out there, you know, that, that if, if you have, like, if it was unique just to us, then I would say yes, right? If it, if it was only our, our nation that had the capabilities of incorporating all the automation and all that other stuff, Otherwise, it neutralizes, right? If everybody else has the same same thing that you have, or at least in time or a short amount of time, they will have what you have, then it's no longer you know, available for a strategic positioning to have that automation thing going because now you're stuck again back to the other forces that are going to be out there, you know, land costs, energy costs, transportation costs, stuff like that. So it may work. It might work for a short time, but it's not going to be like long term, right? So I guess that that's the two questions: short term capabilities, yeah, maybe, right? Long term, no, not at all. Yeah, you know? and it's like, yeah, you know, I, I mean, that's the way I kind of see it. All right, I have a question about the Cantillon effect. Isn't it predicted on the assumption of using a fixed supply currency such as gold? If so, does it still apply to American current situation? Yeah, that's a great question, Brody. And I've had a lot of people actually tell me that the Cantillon effect no longer applies because of legal tender laws, right? So let's take, for example, okay, um, and I would say, yes, it still applies, right? Just not in the same fashion in, in which that it was would be gold because gold has a limitation and eventually comes to a point in which it says, like, nobody else out there is going to be sending you any more gold, right? You have all of it. Now it's your turn to now distribute that gold back out there to the rest of the world. And this is kind of how the Cantillon effect would, would play out, that if you're an industrious nation 
you acquire all the gold from all your production that you have done. Once you have accumulated all that gold, then it's time to redistribute that gold back out there to the rest of the world. And as much as you wouldn't want to, it's going to end up kind of going that way regardless, either through war efforts or, you know, just trying to live yourself. You know, you need to buy things. So you'd end up redistributing that gold back out there to the rest of the world. The United States didn't do that, right? When it came time to redistributing the gold out there to the rest of the world, we switched over to a 100% fiat currency, which meant that we were now going to be issuing out debt, right? So when it came time for us to be purchasing stuff from the rest of the world, and instead of sending them the gold, we sent them debt. We sent them promises to pay. All right. So now does the Cantillon effect still play out? Well, yes, I would say that it does because now instead of like waiting for the end of the system from the gold redistributing back out there to the rest of the world, we're waiting for the end of the system to come from the lack of being able to distribute debt out there to the rest of the world. So at that point, the Cantillon effect will still play in. We'll start to fall into poverty and misery. All right, so that's like kind of quickly describing it here in the United States as far as what we are facing. But now when we think about like legal tender laws inside of other nations, right? So let's take, for example, like Zimbabwe, right? We'll take Zimbabwe and let's say they have a legal tender law that says you cannot use anything except for Zimbabwe dollars, right? You can't use US dollars. You can't use gold. You can't use anything else. You can only use Zimbabwe dollars in this nation, which forces then all the stores and the banks and the businesses to operate with Zimbabwe dollars, okay? So this is kind of one of these legal tender laws that then says, okay, so now all these economic forces that would typically say Zimbabwe would switch over to a different currency, right? Because Zimbabwe dollars sucks and nobody wants them. They have a legal tender law that says, no, you can't use other currencies. You can only use this particular currency. What ends up happening from that is the black market value of like the illegal currencies like dollars or gold or something end up really going up in value because anything that you take and make anything that you have that somebody wants that you make illegal causes the price to go up. Think about sex, drugs, alcohol, anything like that, firearms. It doesn't matter what it is. If you have a law against it and people want it, the price of it will start to move up. So the exact legal tender laws that Zimbabwe would institute up upon their their people saying hey you can only use this type of currency would actually create a black market value for the dollar to be incredibly high comparatively to if they did not have that that legal tender law of course if they didn't have the legal tender law Gresham's law would kick in nobody would want to use Zimbabwe dollars and everybody would want to use the 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 US dollar right the the actual you know currency of value right or the perceived one out there. And so Gresham's law would then say, okay, this bad currency is Zimbabwe dollars, which really has no value to it, would completely fall, be completely worthless. Nobody would touch it. Thier's law would kick in and say, okay, the dollar now replaces the Zimbabwe dollar. Right? So, yeah, I still think that they apply. I think that they apply in a way that it makes it a little more obscured because you have the political you know, aspect of it that can then draw out how long the collapse would take, especially like things here in the United States, considering we should have collapsed back in the 70s or even earlier than that. But yet they can continue on with these systems by you know, the issuance of debt, you know, kind of style, issuing a paper in place of gold. These things can be done, but they can only be done for so long before the economic forces kick in and then destroy it again. All right, got a dollar forty nine up there from Dave Hughes Farm. Thank you so much for the dollar forty nine super sticker. Very much uh, appreciate that support. All right, can't legislate behavior. Hey U E, hope you get ten miles of gas out of it. I'll get a few miles of gas. I really appreciate it, man. All right, being in trucking industry for twenty five years regularly changes from feast to famine. Repeat, yeah. You know? Um, Mil Melton says that won't even tickle the needle on the fuel tank. <laughs> uh, surely we'll get seven miles of gas. All right, Brody says, I think the crucial or the critical thing is what you are allowed to pay in taxes. In yeah, and that's eventually what's going to end up being the the legal tender part of things, right? 
but it, it doesn't matter even if you have legal tender laws like they had it in venezuela for the longest time right that you couldn't use us dollars but then you know the pain got so so hard on the people that they finally like relinquished it they said okay yeah fine go ahead use us dollars and then all of a sudden all these us dollars started ripping through the system and things started to flourish people were like doing business biz like people's actual businesses started to grow and doing well and profiting right as this new money was flowing through the system people were really enjoying it but the only problem is is that once the new money turned off right so people had a hoard of dollars that they weren't using they were basically sitting on it using it as a security but once the availability of dollars became legal for venezuela people started using it because dang man look at all the stuff that they could buy with it so once that new supply of money from these people who were hoarding it was distributed out there, well, the new supply wasn't coming in and then boom, everything fell again, right? And so they ended up like, you know, going back into recessionary pressures as the most industrious people out there started hoarding, hoarding the dollars and pulling it back out of the economy, leaving nothing but Venezuelan dollars in it. Uh, Let's see, let's cruise up here a little ways. Uh, maybe we should just hoard goods and gold and sell when high price. I mean, I think on a personal level, that's great. Yeah. All right, all nighter. I'm wondering the same thing. Oh, talking to Brody up here. Let's see what Brody had to say first. I mean, sure, there could be hyperinflation or the world could abandon the dollar, but I don't see a plausible path to either, either of those things happening. What do you think? Uh, All Nighter says, I wonder the same thing, Brody, with the WRC, how does that play into Cantillon effect, the world reserve currency, um, with the dollar network effect, which will win? It's, you know, that's what's, like, you know, there was a time like after the great financial crisis and I was losing my job and I was losing everything and I'm watching like, you know, the money printer taking off and all this quantitative easing and all the other stuff. I thought, man, there is no way that the dollar is going to survive through all this. Like I was pretty sure at that time that, you know, the dollar wasn't going to make it another five to 10 years. Right? And I was basically conditioning myself and everything to, to have that kind of outcome didn't happen right didn't even come close to happening and so i had to like take into consideration that things are not the way that i had assumed they were that money printing and the hyperinflation scenario that was supposed to have come from it and didn't manifest itself really kind of screwed me up right because i was pretty much anticipating that we were going to be in a hyperinflation scenario and in 2011, when I started seeing like silver running up to $50 an ounce, I thought I was like the smartest person in the world and that everybody was like, in a, you know, lose everything that they ever had. And I was going to be super rich. Right. I mean, this is literally some of the thoughts that I had, you know, only to find, you know, silver falling from $50 an ounce all the way back down into the teens and that my entire silver hoard that I had was pretty much, you know, underwater, so to speak, like I had spent way more on it than it was worth. And I had to reconsider the whole money printer causing a hyperinflation scenario. I had to figure it out. Why didn't it occur back then? In fact, how is it that they could print up all this money and not even get the inflationary scenario that they were looking for? None of that stuff made sense to me at all. So I had to start breaking down the monetary policy to figure out what it was that was taking place. And once I started doing that, I abandoned the whole political arena environment everything like i was like not involved in that sort of thoughts anymore right because that was what led me to believe that there was going to be a hyperinflation scenario to begin with and i was like you guys these politics all that these politicians they don't have my best interest in mind they do not communicate the reality of the situation to the people they are complete buffoons in my opinion like they have no interest in protecting my constitutional rights they have no interest in protecting the constitution in general you know or behaving within the confines of it you know i mean i changed i completely changed everything it was that i was believing at the time and when i started studying more about the monetary policies coming from the federal reserve i realized that man nobody 
nobody's got this. Nobody's got this right. They do not, like, like, literally nobody's got it right. You know, I have very few times do I ever see anything written down inside of a news article or even from another YouTuber out there or anybody who talks about the monetary policy coming from the Federal Reserve in a way that has been that has been being conducted in for like the last 20 years plus. Right? They, everybody has this perception that the Federal Reserve is flying on the seat of their pants with these decisions that they're making. And, and it's delusional. It's, that is completely delusional to think. Yeah. Or even worse, they think that politics are involved. Yeah. All right, 318 people with 96 likes. Thank you so much for hitting that like button. We poured many billions into Ukraine and Israel, and we're feeling the inflation now, so the Fed keeps rates up. So, I mean, you know, there's a couple of ways that you can get money out of this nation, right? I mean, you can just straight up give it to another nation. You can loan it to them. You can go and buy their stuff, right? No matter what it is, you got to get the dollars out of the nation. Right, so sending it over to Ukraine for their war effort or whatever, hey, that's part of the game, man. It's all about getting the money out and filling the sluices. That's why when it comes to stimulus packages here in the United States, it doesn't really matter how they get it out, right? That's why they're willing to pay somebody, you know, eighty dollars an hour to go paint, you know, little rivets and stuff like that, and you know, consider like you know, shovel ready jobs and all this other stuff. It doesn't matter how they get that money out. It really doesn't. As so long as it gets out there and starts filling the sluices up, because if they just waste that money on the people to just go and spend it however they want, then they'll go and spend it at the restaurants, they'll buy clothing, they'll go on you know, vacation, they'll do all the stuff with that money and it'll start moving the economy around. So like, as far as logical placement of that dollars, no, 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 that's not something that the government does. They don't take into consideration like how that money is being spent. All they take into consideration is that the money gets out there. And if they can do it in a way that gets them reelected, then that's cool by their part. But as far as being like, you know, actual efficiency or logical or reinvestment or something like that, hey, Mike, what's happening, man? That's, that stuff doesn't happen. All right, that's not the way it works. And you know, if it was like maybe a productive saving society, then that might be the case. But we're a consuming indebted nation. We, it doesn't matter how the money gets out there so long as it just starts flowing, you know? And so again, like when it comes to providing the world with the world reserve currency, how do you get the dollars out there? It's Triffin's dilemma, right? That's why the United States buys so much stuff. We're in deficit trade. And so that, you know, ultimately the demand for dollars that exist out there, we can, we can meet that demand for, from the world by buying the world stuff and sending our dollars out there. And if they, if we can't buy enough stuff, then we're going to have to figure out a way to get it out to them. You know, maybe during war efforts, here you go. Here's a bunch of money. Yeah. I'm not saying it's good and, and don't, I'm not arguing for it. Right? I'm not trying to say that. What I'm trying to say is that our system is in such a condition that that's the way it has to exist. Right? There's no, there's no reversing and going back to sound principles. Right? Like, I mean, there's, there, you could. I mean, there, I like the idea behind it, but the actual capabilities of making that happen or being in a condition in which that something like that would happen, that's that's not that's not a gun. That's not going to occur. <laughs> It's just too painful for the people. Ken FX, thank you so much for the $5 super sticker there with the thumbs up. Um, gold and silver coins, that's it. Dollars are a fiat promise to pay. What's the next credible threat? Well, I, I mean, I don't know what the next credible threat would be, but I'm assuming the next one that you're probably going to end up finding out there, if it's not just the Federal Reserve talking about their interest rates and where they're planning on moving them or keeping that open-ended credible threat, what you're going to end up finding is that we're going to start running into liquidity issues here in the next couple of months. I'm sure of it. Like, you can already see it starting to happen. 
within a lot of things. Like, you know, the interest rates moving up, that's the cost of money. And if the interest rates are moving up, that means money is less available out there for people to borrow, right? And if you can't borrow as much, you're not going to buy houses and cars and go on vacation. That's going to slow the economy down. All right. So, okay. So the next credible threat that we're actually going to be running into is probably going to end up being from that liquidity crisis or liquidity issues that are running up, the bond market becoming illiquid, right? So somebody goes to sell a bond and they, they can't find a buyer for it, right? The price will fall and the interest rates will rise and that's a very bad condition. The bond market, the U.S. Treasury bond market, I should say, the U.S. Treasury market is by far the most liquid market, the deepest market that you could ever possibly find out there. And if that thing becomes illiquid, you're going to find some serious issues taking place within the financial system, right? So it's very critical that the U.S. Treasury bond market stays liquid and being able to provide the liquidity to that bond market is really where the credible threat is going to start taking place. So this is what's going to end up happening is, is that you're going to find where the Treasury Department is going to step up and they're going to say, okay, we are going to be here to provide the liquidity by buying back our own bonds. This is very, like, you could go and look up where the Treasury Department was actually talking about this. And I believe it's uh, the Treasury Secretary to Financial Markets, I think that's what this title is, and I think the guy's name is Josh Frost. I would have to look it up just to make sure, but I'm pretty sure that was it. He even said this. He goes, by the bond, by the Treasury making this announcement that they are going to be buying back their own bonds, ought to bring in the willing participants, the investors, into the bond market, meaning that they are going to be providing the liquidity, just simply knowing that the treasury is there to backstop it. So although the treasury says, yes, we are going to buy back our own bonds, that credible threat alone by stating that ought to give the confidence to the market itself, the investors, to be the willing participants within that bond market, knowing that they have the treasury department backing them up, right? See, this is the same credible threat that was used to support the corporations during the pandemic with the special purpose vehicles. Just the statement alone that the Federal Reserve was going to be buying corporate debt or that the Federal Reserve and the Treasury using that special purpose vehicle, just that statement alone was enough to get the market to start buying into the corporate debt. The Federal Reserve and the Treasury with that special purpose vehicle didn't have to do it, didn't have to do anything at all, right? But that credible threat alone was enough to start supporting the market. So that's one that I would think to keep an eye out for because what, if that bond market becomes illiquid, then we're going to see seeing some serious issues taking place within the banking system. And remember, the Treasury Department hasn't done a bond buyback in like over 20 years, right? So this is a very unique situation. Somebody asked me also, it's like, well, with what money? What money? They don't have any money. Government borrows all their money. That's not true, right? They do have money. I mean, they do. it's true that they borrow all their money, but it's not true that they don't have cash. Go and take a look at the Treasury General account right now, the T TGA. If you just type into your Google search, Treasury General Account FRED, Fred, it'll pop up with the chart. And you can see right now that there is an insane amount of money sitting in this particular account. Typically, they would have not even half of what they have in there right now, all right? After the pandemic, the Treasury General Account was loaded with a bunch of money, but that was for the stimulus package. There was two shots of it, right? Two big spikes in the Treasury General account as far as their cash holdings go. Both of those were the stimulus package. Right now, there's another huge spike inside of the Treasury General account full of cash, but there's no plan for a stimulus package, right? There's no idea, there's nothing out there that says they're gonna do that. Why do they have all this cash sitting there? I mean, here they are issuing out all this debt, not spending it on anything, but literally holding the cash in the Treasury General account. Why? Right? It's for this moment that's coming up. Right? And that's why they're doing it. It's, it's like, it, it, it seems so obvious to me, but yet I hardly find anybody ever talking about it. Ever. Right? But that's going to be the next big one, the next big credible threat. Okay, let me see. Did I get another one down there? I did. Ken FX, thank you so much for the $10. The only thing printing money does is more inflation and more prices 
and more up prices everywhere. Truckers will always be needed or always need nothing moves in this country without truckers. I totally agree about the truckers thing, but the money printing as far as only thing it does is cause more inflation and move prices up is I, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for the, for the $10. I really appreciate it. But I want to say that is a very illogical statement. That is not correct. Okay. And the reason why you can say that it's not correct is because the federal reserve took their balance sheet from $850 billion to over four and a half trillion dollars after the great financial crisis and failed, failed to get the 2% inflation target that they were looking for. They didn't go over it. They were under it the entire time, right? Not the entire time. I shouldn't say they did get a couple of shots where they did get over the 2%, but it wasn't enough. And in fact, it was such an insignificant amount that they were able to actually achieve their 2% inflation target that they've actually con changed the way that they view inflation and now go for a 2% average inflation rate over time so that they can attempt to try and get the inflation that they are actually looking for. See, the major problem that they were facing back during quantitative easing one, two, three, and four after the great financial crisis is the low interest rates. Low interest rates, like near the lower bound of zero when they were close to zero, actually has a negative return on capital, meaning that you go and you loan money to like the government, the 10-year treasury by buying 10-year treasuries or something. By the time you get your money back with the interest, you will have lost purchasing power of all that money meaning that you might as well have just spent it that day instead of investing it. So when you're at a low interest rate environment and you have a low or even negative return on capital investment, that is a deflationary force that has taken place. I don't care how much money you print. Right? That's, it's just the case. You will find where certain particular assets will move up dramatically. How like real estate moved up, bonds moved up, stocks moved up, but things that you borrow money for to buy, those will move up. But if it's just a regular item that's out there that doesn't get borrowed money to purchase, then you're not going to see a big inflationary scenario because inflation is really caused by the increase in consumption. Right? See, money printing doesn't really do it. It's the added consumption that comes from the money printing that would cause the inflation. You see, money has to come in at all channels. One of the reasons why we had so much inflation this time around from all the money printing is because everybody got stimulus checks and ran out there and spent that money on anything that they wanted. It increased consumption, right? So all of a sudden you had this increase in consumption where people are out there buying all this stuff and you severed the supply chain at the same time. Now you got supply demand imbalances. That's where prices are found from supply versus demand. So if this is the situation that you have where you have a severed supply chain and a stimulus package moved out there, people are running out there spending that money at all channels in all ways at the exact same time, then yes, you will find an inflationary scenario from it. But you can take the balance sheet from $850 billion to $4.5 trillion, which is over a quadrupling of the money supply, much more than the doubling of the money supply that we just saw. Right? It was a quadrupling of it and failed to get the inflation scenario. If you cannot explain it and don't understand why that happened, then you're missing it, right? Because it's not just the money printing go burr, it's situations within this, the economy itself that is causing the inflation to take place. Now, what is inflation? Inflation is the expansion of money and credit. What are prices? It's the results of that. How do those prices move up? From the consumption supply demand imbalances so you can go ahead and print up all this money but if people don't have access to it meaning that it just sits in the bank and doesn't do anything then all that money doesn't chase goods and services it doesn't create the inflationary scenario right. so it's important to understand that because it's not just the federal reserve printing money if that was the case then quantitative easing one two three and four would have totally caused the inflation scenario that the Fed was looking for, but they were running out of monetary policy by the, by the end of all that. Like they were like, dang, man, all that money printing and still did not get the inflation that we needed in order to conduct ourselves appropriately. It's crazy, right? right moving on. Uh, St. Louis Fed website has an article titled, why does the U.S. Treasury have so much cash at the Fed, they say it's saved for an emergency and give one example of an emergency, cyber attack. That's odd. <laughs> well, they can't, I mean, 
I doubt that they were like they've made the announcement that they are planning on this bond buyback, but they don't talk about it. Like it's not something that is discussed regularly. Like you know, you would think like you know you would read about it in articles, you would hear other economists talking about it and stuff. They just don't. Right? And yeah, that would be a major emergency. A liquidity issue within the bond market would be a major issue. All right, are you talking about money velocity with this explanation, right? Yes, I was. All right, taxation is the problem. Could be. I'm pretty good. I'm a welder, too. Still have a hard time making any money. Don't forget, people stayed home and a lot went to live with their parents and they had more disposable income. Uh, don't you think this is a battle with deflation? I think everything that the Federal Reserve is doing right now is an attempt to try and battle against deflation. All the things that they are doing right now was described by Ben Bernanke back in 2002 in a speech on how to prevent deflation from ever occurring here in the United States. And they, he said in that speech, if in deflation was to occur, there are steps that they could go through in order to combat against it. We are now in every single one of those that he was describing. Like everything that is going on right now is a battle against deflation. It is so, and people are thinking that they're battling against inflation. That's not correct. It's exactly the opposite of that. Um, see, dude, there's plenty to be made in Bristol Bay with those two skills, May and June would keep you busy. Two cars, one truck, one motorcycle, my other ride is, no. Uh, good one, Chad. All right. Uh, do you think the bond market is a root of all evil? No, I don't think anything is evil. I'm gonna have to go here soon, guys. Um, I don't think anything is evil. It's just the way it is, right? It's just the way that it's ended up being regardless of what anybody says out there, yeah, there's a new world order. Yeah, there's a group of families out there who are trying to control the world. There's all that stuff out there. I totally agree with it. I've done the research into it. I've seen it. I, it's a very depressive research if you ever go in into it. Not worth it to me. It's not worth the time to to do that. What is worth the time is to understand what it is that the monetary system is so that you can conduct yourself most appropriately. If there are people out there who are taking advantage of it, there's nothing you're going to be able to do about it, right? I mean, there is stuff that we can do about it. We can put all our money into gold and silver, take it all out of the banking system, don't work for a W-2, don't pay taxes, don't do all that stuff that nobody's going to do. Okay, now that we understand that part of it, yeah, there's evilness kind of lurking inside of all that stuff because people can take advantage of other people with the knowledge that they have. However, you need to position yourself. And yeah, there's evil out there everywhere, right? Now, whether the bond market itself is evil, I don't look at it like that. It's not evil. It's not good. It's just an is, right? It's like the weather out there. Is there good weather, bad weather? Who knows? I mean, it's a really nice sunny day out right now, but... You know, uh, my particular area is a very lush, beautiful place, and it comes because of all the rain that we experience. So I appreciate the rain as much as I appreciate the sun. It's not good or bad. It just is. And that's the way that, like, the economy, the money system, the bond market, like, gold and silver, all that stuff. It's just an is, and you just got to figure out how to work it, you know? Uh... Uh, yes, the bond market is just a UBI for billionaires, universal basic income, free money for those who already have money. Uh, I've heard Henry Kissinger say once that monetary system will never collapse because they will indefinitely keep printing money. Isn't that evil? I don't know. I mean, is it evil to have a pretty decent standard of living where you can actually buy into the bond market where you can get a return that is going to continuously pay you until you pass away in your life is that evil i mean it seems like a pretty good deal i mean i guess it's evil for a lot of people out there and i guess it's evil for people who don't have that kind of situation happening but i don't know, know if that's necessarily evil for those people out there i mean you know <laughs>
All right. Can you explain your view on how deflation is a threat in the Fed's eyes? It's hard for us normal Joes to see it. Thanks, Simon. All right, let me see here. Okay, I got to go, so I really can't explain that into any real depth right now because I would end up being out here for 10 minutes. But ultimately, if you have a deflationary scenario that has taken place, think about the business. Like, I mean, we're most of the time when we look at it, we think, okay, we get our income and then we got to go out and spend that money. How we spend that money is how we kind of look at the economy when we're working from that point of view. But now you look at it from a different point of view. Look at it from your business point of view. You got all these items that are sitting out there that are for sale for $15. Let's just make up a number right here, right now, right? But we're in a deflationary scenario where people are anticipating that prices are gonna be going down. Now they could come in and buy your item for $15, but they're thinking, nah, you know, if I wait just a little bit, I might be able to pick it up for $12 or even better, I might be able to get it for $10, right? So now they're not coming into your store to buy that item for $15, right? Let's think about it from an inflation for $15 when they think they can get it for 10 if they just wait. That's a deflationary scenario. You're no longer conducting business, and guess what? You're probably going to have to lay that dude off that you've hired, right? So now layoffs and all that other stuff start to happen because of this deflationary scenario that is now occurring for the business owner. Now look at it from the inflationary point of view, right? This item sits on the shelf at $15, but yet there's somebody out there who believes that the price is going to be moving up pretty soon. It's going to go to $18. They're running in there and picking it off the shelf before that happens. Now you got business taking place. You see, inflationary scenarios is good for the business owner as the idea that in prices are going to be moving up now encourages people to go out there and spend their money before that happens, right? Deflationary scenarios, people hoard and save and don't conduct themselves in business because they're waiting for the better opportunity to come. And so business slows down, money transactions slows down, savings increase, right? These are the type of things that happen in a deflationary environment. Inflationary scenario, people are spending money, they're going out there doing business, there's lots of items being moved around, people are getting hired to move those items around, right? So inflation, deflation. And again, like, we look at it from a different point of view, like how do we spend our money? We would love it if our dollars go a little bit further and we would spend more money into the economy if we did. But from the business owner's point of view, you can already see it that yes, you would spend more money. Unfortunately, I got $15 items sitting on the shelf and I won't be able to buy the $10 items until the $15 and items are gone. So therefore, my business will probably shut down and new businesses will start once the people have come to the conclusion that the prices aren't going to be falling any further. Right? Once that happens, then new business can start taking off again. I mean, just think about it. Would you build a house with the anticipation that you're going to sell it for $400,000, but by the time you're done with it, it only sells for three hundred? dollars Would you build the house? Of course not. Right? Why would you? This is the exact situation that the people are facing right now within this nation when it comes to the real estate market. And home builders are very nervous. Like they, like it doesn't matter what the house price sells for, so long as they can make a profit. That's the only thing that they care about. But if they have a projection of four hundred thousand, but they get there and they can only sell it for three hundred and twenty-five, that eats out all the margin, all the profit, all the you know business that they were going to do. Why even try? You know, why do that? So they won't. Inflationary scenario, they'll be all over it. Deflationary scenario, uh, -uh not doing it. Right. So anyway, I got to go, guys. I hope you enjoyed this live stream. We got $16.49 in Super Chats. I really appreciate all that support. Thank you, Ken FX, for that and the questions. Um, we have 341 people watching with 147 likes. Thank you so much for hitting that like button. I really appreciate that. The algorithm does, too. Um, I would love to sit out here and keep talking. These questions are just flying across the screen, but I got to go back to work. All right, uneducated economist, you guys let me know.